Could alien life already have heard us? Every broadcast we've ever made has been racing outward at the speed of light for over a century. And somewhere, only 18 light years away, those signals are washing over a rocky planet orbiting a red sun, a world in the habitable zone where liquid water could exist. If anyone's there, they're already hearing the faint echoes of Earth. And if they answered tonight, we'd hear their reply before this century ends. Not in some distant future, but within a single lifetime. So maybe the question isn't if the universe is listening, but what happens when it finally answers back. GJ251 sits only 18 light years from Earth, practically next door, the 74th closest star in a galaxy of 100 billion, a red dwarf, old, common, unremarkable. For decades, we ignored stars like this, too small, too dim, too violent. We assumed planets around them couldn't support life. The stellar flares would strip away atmospheres, sterilize surfaces, leave nothing but barren rocks. But scientists kept watching GJ251 anyway. For 20 years, they tracked its motion, looking for wobbles, searching for the gravitational tug of planets pulling on the star. In 2020, they found one. GJ251b, almost twice the size of Earth, potentially rocky, a 14-day orbit. For a moment, there was excitement a terrestrial planet around a nearby star, exactly what we've been searching for. But when they calculated the distance from its star, the hope faded. Too close, too hot, not habitable. Still, the team kept watching because the data kept hinting at something else. Red dwarf stars are chaos incarnate. Their surfaces churn with magnetic storms, star spots rotate across their faces, flares erupt without warning. Each creates an apparent wobble in the star's light, radial velocity signals that can look exactly like a planet tugging on it. It's like trying to hear a whisper in a thunderstorm. When researchers combined 20 years of observations from five different telescopes around the world, they found dozens of signals. Most were noise, stellar tantrums pretending to be planets. But one signal kept appearing, a rhythm. Every 54 days, the star wobbled. The pattern suggested a planet, and the timing placed it right in the habitable zone. The problem? The signal was tangled with the star's 100-day rotation period. Every time they thought they had it isolated, the noise drowned it out. Most planet-hunting telescopes observe invisible light. But stellar activity screams invisible wavelengths. It drowns out everything else. Instruments like the Habitable Zone Planet Finder in Texas works exclusively in infrared. In infrared wavelengths, the stellar noise drops to a whisper while planetary signals stay strong. When the team restricted their analysis to just infrared data, something remarkable happened. The forest of false signals vanished. One rhythm remained. 54 days, clear, unmistakable, persistent. And after 20 years, the math finally converged. A planet, almost four times Earth's mass, super Earth class, likely rocky, with a gravitational pull strong enough to hold on to an atmosphere, sitting dead center in the habitable zone. They named it GJ251C, and then the implications started to sink in. If you could somehow stand on GJ251C, you'd know immediately you weren't on Earth. The sky wouldn't be blue. The sky would be deeper, shades of orange and crimson bleeding into rust, like perpetual sunset, but darker, heavier. You'd look up and see a sun that doesn't blind, a dim crimson disk hanging in the sky, larger than our sun appears from Earth but softer. And if you looked around, you might not see green. Plants, if they evolved here, 
wouldn't photosynthesize the way Earth's plants do. Green chlorophyll works under a yellow sun. Under a red sun, you'd need something more efficient. The vegetation, if it exists, might be black, deep purple, dark red, leaves designed to absorb every photon they can possibly get. And you'd notice something else. The sun doesn't move. GJ251C is likely tidally locked, one side always facing the star, the other in permanent darkness. If you're standing on the day side, the sun hangs frozen in the sky, forever noon, forever red. Temperatures reaching 100 degrees Celsius, radiation bombarding the surface, the ground cracked and dry, baked under a sun that never sets. If you walked far enough, if you could survive long enough, you'd cross into the Terminator Zone, the thin band where day meets night. Here, the sun sits eternally on the horizon, half light, half shadow, temperatures drop, the ground cools. And if GJ251C has an atmosphere, if winds can circulate heat from the scorched day side to the frozen night side, this narrow corridor might be the only place where water flows. Oceans in perpetual twilight, mist rising where warmth meets cold, waves lapping against shores that never see full daylight or complete darkness. This is where life would cling, if it exists at all. But walk farther into the night side, and you'd enter a different kind of hell. Eternal darkness, temperatures plunging below negative 150 degrees Celsius, the atmosphere collapsing as frost onto the frozen ground, ice that never melts, silence that never breaks. Two hemispheres, fire and ice, and between them, a thin ribbon of possibility. If intelligence evolved here, it would understand balance in a way we never had to. It would know that survival means staying in the narrow space between extremes, and it would look up at the stars, at the one stable point of light in a sky of crimson and shadow, and wonder, is anyone else out there? Radio waves travel at the speed of light. Our earliest broadcasts have been radiating into space for nearly a century. Every transmission we've ever made doesn't just vanish, it keeps going, expanding outward in a sphere, growing wider with every passing year. That sphere has already reached GJ251. And right now, at this moment, our signals are washing over that world. If anyone there has built radio telescopes, if they've developed technology comparable to ours, they're picking up fragments of Earth, voices, music, the chaotic electromagnetic noise of a technological civilization. They'd know someone is here. And if we sent a message tonight, a deliberate signal aimed at GJ251, it would arrive in 2043. We'd hear their reply by 2061. People alive today could send a message and live to hear the response. Children born this year could grow up knowing there was a message traveling toward another world. They could be in their 30s when the answer arrives. This isn't science fiction. This is geometry and light speed. Red dwarfs are the most common stars in the galaxy. Roughly 70% of all stars are red dwarfs. And for decades, we dismissed them. We looked past them, searching for sun-like stars, yellow dwarfs, stable and familiar. But we kept finding planets around red dwarfs anyway. Proxima Centauri b, the closest exoplanet to Earth, the Trappist-1 system, seven rocky planets orbiting a single red dwarf. The James Webb Space Telescope has been checking. Some of the innermost planets around Trappist-1 show little atmosphere. Too close to their star, the radiation stripped them bare. But the planets farther out? The ones in the habitable zone? The data's still coming in. GJ251C orbits slightly farther from its star than most habitable zone planets around red dwarfs. That distance might be enough, just enough shielding from the worst radiation, just enough room for an atmosphere to survive. Right now, we've never actually seen GJ251C. 
We infer it exists by watching its star wobble. The gravitational tug as the planet orbits pulls the star slightly toward us, then away. But the 30-meter telescope, currently in development, will have mirrors larger than any ground-based telescope ever built. It will be the only telescope with sufficient resolution to directly image exoplanets like this one. Not infer, image, actually see it. Catch light bouncing off its surface. Split that light into a spectrum. Search for water vapor, oxygen, methane, carbon dioxide, chemical signatures that might reveal oceans, clouds, photosynthesis, life. We're talking about studying another world the way we study Earth from orbit. Watching storms move across its surface, tracking seasonal changes, mapping its geography. And we could do it within the lifetimes of people alive today. A generation from now, children might grow up learning about GJ251C, the way we learned about Mars, not as an abstraction, but as a place, a world with geography and weather, and maybe, just maybe, inhabitants who are wondering the same things we are. Maybe habitable worlds aren't rare treasures scattered across impossible distances. Maybe they're common, hidden in stellar noise, orbiting the stars we've dismissed, requiring exactly the kind of patient precision we're finally learning. GJ251C has been there the entire time. Our signals are already there. And if there's a civilization on GJ251C, they're not hearing silence when they point their instruments toward our sun. They're hearing us, fragments of humanity. Maybe they're listening right now. Maybe they've already sent a reply. And maybe the distance between stars isn't as lonely as it feels. GJ251C isn't just another exoplanet. It's a mirror showing us that distance doesn't always mean separation. Because what we see in the space between stars isn't so different from what we feel between each other. And if a world like this can exist so close, orbiting the most common type of star in the galaxy, then maybe the universe was never quiet. Maybe the silence we hear is just the echo of our own. And maybe the universe isn't asking us to speak louder. Maybe it's just asking us to listen.